So on our next uh, topic here, we're talking about nuclear physics, and now we sort of jump a little bit uh, after quantum mechanics. And now we're talking about uh, the very first thing is uh, closest approach distance. So this could be, for example, when uh, some particle is flying at another particle. So uh, the famous example to use is actually little alpha particles. And if you take little alpha particles and you kind of shoot them at, let's say, a gold nucleus. So this is actually one of the first ones that was done. So let's just say you shoot them near gold. Well, this particle right here, let's say alpha, which is a positive, and uh, gold right here, well, it's going to want to sort of curve away. So it'll tend to do a path like this. It'll sort of curve away. You could actually find that angle if you wanted to and do some crazy stuff there. But it turns out, what if your particle came in, uh, oops, I'm trying to draw a straight line here. That was not very straight. Oops. So let's just say uh, my particle, instead of coming in like this right here, it came in really, really close to this gold. Now what it's going to do, it's not going to actually run into the gold though, but it's going to sort of turn around still. And the reason it doesn't run into it is uh, because these uh, forces here are actually very strong. So as it comes in right here, these electrostatic forces are going to be enough to sort of deflect it here. So what will happen, of course, is it will reach some sort of distance that's the closest approach distance. In other words, you know, how close did it get? Well, it got as close as R in this case. Right here. Okay, so if you look at this, how close can these alpha particles come to the gold nucleus? They can come as close as R. And the important thing to talk about is what happens at closest approach. This is really important. Because just like with conservation of energy, uh, these sort of examples that you've done, you know, in topic two, which is all about mechanics and you can use energy. Once you know the total uh, energy, E total, well, that's equal to the energy kinetic plus the energy potential. So this total energy, we're going to assume it's conserved. So it's coming in with a lot of speed. But let's say the uh, potential energy uh, due to the, uh, so the electrostatic potential energy would be zero way over here at the left. As it comes closer and closer, of course, it's going to slow down until it eventually stops. So the key thing is at closest approach, what happens? You know, the E K equals zero at that point. So that means then all it is, it's all about potential energy. That's your important thing here. So in other words, it's all E P, so to speak. In other words, if we told you the kinetic energy coming in, uh, then you could actually be able to solve for lots of things just by knowing this, that the kinetic energy coming in initially uh, will be totally converted to potential energy at this point. Now we can actually use some of our uh, equations from the equation sheet to figure out what's happening. First of all, we need to know what the electrostatic potential energy is. So maybe we need to hunt around for different topics here. Uh, where is it? It's topic five, I think. Actually, it's uh, topic nine, technically. So here's the one that we want right here. We want to know about this right here, uh, just so you know at least, this is the standard level and the higher level different uh, sort of columns. And over here, the left side, this is all for gravitation. Just so you remember what goes where. This is gravitation, this is electrical, this is gravitation, and this is electrical as well. These sort of columns here. So we look for something where we have potential energy, which is this one right here. Okay, so we have delta V, which is the potential, equals the potential energy over charge. So I'm going to write that one down. I'm going to put these maybe in red because they're important starting points. I'm going to write down the ones that we get from our equation sheet. You don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Just go and hunt for your equations. Okay, so we'll write it down just like it was. So it was delta V was delta EP over Q. So if we want delta EP, well then we just do delta V, we multiply it by Q. The problem is, what's delta V? It's not velocity. This is actually an uh, electric potential. This is potential energy, this is electric potential, otherwise known as voltage. So we need to find an equation for that. Luckily, just below it is just what we need. So just below it is this one here. So V is KQ over R. I'm going to write that down as well. Maybe in red as well. So V is KQ over R. The delta doesn't really matter. So in this case right here, then we've got this KQ over R. Well, if I put these two together, then I get uh, KQ over R which is what I was looking at here. That's my delta V. And then my delta V equals EP over Q. In other words, now I can just put them together here. So uh, we can see then that uh, my Q's right here, well, they're going to, if I want to, to know EP on its own, uh, then I can calculate everything I need. But in fact, I want to get, um, well, I can write it like this, KQ1, Q2. I should be very careful here. These are different Q values here. These are different charges. All that over R, 
equals delta E P. And now if I want to get the radius then, this is the final thing then. Oops, I should probably be doing this in black. So I could say, therefore, the closest approach, in other words, that radius here, this R value, is going to be, well, I just uh, switch this one for this one. So in other words, it's going to be K Q1 Q2 over your potential energy. This is all you need for closest approach. Remember now, if you're not sure what K is, K is just a constant. That comes from your equation sheet as well. It's the Coulomb's constant. So it's the one that has to do with uh, charge. Don't uh, mistake that one for the Boltzmann's constant. That's one that's used for other topics. But uh, this one here is Coulomb's constant, K. has to do with charge. So look for something with C in it, because that's Coulomb's of charge. Okay, so that's how you do uh, closest approach distances. And as long as you know the charge of your gold, let's say, and the charge of your uh, alpha particles, you can find how close they'll come if you were originally told the speed that it came in at, because that speed will be kinetic, and that'll turn into potential. Okay, so that kinetic energy will be 100% turned to potential, so that would be this value here. Therefore, you can calculate it pretty simply. Another thing you can do is something called a Bainbridge mass spectrometer. We use that to detect the masses of different isotopes. Remember what an isotope is? That's something, uh, for example, let's just say I have uh, uranium. Uranium, I think, is a uh, 92nd element here. So if we have uranium, for example, we could have uranium-235, but we can also have uranium 238. So it's very difficult to actually detect different masses. And the reason is that if you do different experiments, uh, chemical experiments, it's chemically the same uh, atom, the same element. So how can you actually detect them? So this is actually an important way. Okay, so we're actually going to use this one here to actually detect, you know, the existence of isotopes. In fact, we use it for more than that. So. Um, we can tell that isotopes are two things that have a different number of pro, uh, sorry, neutrons. Because uh, remember this bottom number here, that tells you the number of protons. This here tells you the number of neutrons plus protons. Okay, so these ones here clearly have the same number of protons. That's because it's uh, uranium. But they have different number of uh, neutrons. Now how can we actually draw this Bainbridge mass spectrometer? Well, you have to shoot uh, positive, well, in this case here I'm going to give you, let's say we shoot little positive uh, particles. Now we put them through some sort of uh, electrical field here. So we have plates. Maybe this is, um, maybe we make this one here positive and make that one right there negative. And it turns out by applying a magnetic field as well. So let's say we put a magnetic field like this. X's means into the page. You have to imagine the field goes straight into the page. What this will do then, this particle wants to go towards the negative, but this magnetic field will actually give a force going upwards. In other words, if you do it just right, uh, you end up with your particles going straight through. So this section right here is called the uh, velocity selector. Okay, so that actually allows us to select the velocity. So now that they come through this, if they come in straight, we know exactly how fast they were going. I'm actually going to take this whole thing and move it down a little bit. I need just a little bit more space. So if I look at this then, um, what I can do is I can draw what happens in this mass spectrometer. What happens is, of course, they enter a uh, region with uh, a magnetic fields, again, always into the page. And of course, since these are positive particles, they're going to curve around. Remember, we talked about that. But uh, if you remember your hand rules, which is going to be another series of videos of mine where I'll show you these hand rules carefully, but you'd use your right hand rule, and you'd know that because your magnetic field lines are into the page, and because the velocity is to the right, turns out the force is going to be up. In other words, these particles are going to come around and curve. Now the reason why they curve is because uh, we have a magnetic force which is going to be equal to the centripetal force. So we have to look up those two equations. Now uh, let's see, we can find a centripetal force first. I think uh, it's one of the simpler ones here. Centripetal force is going to come from the acceleration here. Acceleration is v squared over r, so if we want force we multiply by m. So m v squared over r. That's going to be uh, this value on the right, m v squared over r. And then on the left right here, we have a magnetic force, and that can actually be found over here. What we were just looking at over here. Magnetic force is QVB. So in that case right there, I'm going to have QVB. Turns out just by using this right here, you can detect lots of things that happen. In other words, the heavier they are, the bigger the circle they're going to make. So just by that, you can actually tell everything that's going to happen. 